I am super excited today. I am in the den or the kitchen of the tuck daddy himself, Christian Subio. And we're going to go deep down into the dish of his mind <laughs> and the pizza. Cheers, Much bro. more shallow than you expect, but salute. Salute, yeah. Oh, that's good. What kind yeah. of beer is that? Irish, I believe. Irish, Irish huh? Irish pale ale of some sort, yeah. Did you pick that? I did, yeah, with a little help from the um, beer concierge, yeah. <laughs> I knew you were coming. I had to deliver you know, something tasty. Well, it's good to be out here. I, we, uh, when I first got in, we went around the Philadelphia a little bit. Uh -huh. What do you think? <laughs> you what, survived. We, we went a quick, we got off the airport, we went right to Philly. What do you think I did when I got there? Uh, oh, you were the Rocky Steps. How'd you know? Because uh, it's, it's, uh, there's that and there's a Liberty Bell and cheesesteaks. Am I that cliche? Uh, no, it's uh, your other people running there, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I wasn't the only yeah. one. And we did do the Liberty Bell yeah. to see it. Yeah. It's a, Liberty Bell is a bit underwhelming. It's about yay big. Yeah. I've never actually been, done the tour. Most Philadelphians, interestingly, have not uh, visited the Liberty Bell. Really? Yeah. It's one of these things that everyone knows about, but yeah. just don't end up there. Yeah. And so you're, you're from Philadelphia originally, right? Well, from the suburbs, yeah. Out here? Uh-huh. Right around here. Born and raised here. Yeah. Yeah. And then you went to med school and college and everything residency? Everything relatively close around here. The only time I went a little bit, I did one year away in Spain and one year up in Rochester, New York, so... Okay, so why um why everything in Philadelphia? Um, close with my family. You know, yeah. Philadelphians tend to be a, uh, I don't know, provincial, I guess. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, big family around here, um, friends, family. I don't know. I it's it's home to me. So I never yeah. really felt the need to go too far. I got that out of my system when I uh, lived in Spain for a year, and that was one of the best years of my life. But you know, at the end of that year, I was really looking forward to coming home. Uh, most Philadelphians are something about this place that I don't know. Even when I go out to. A couple of months ago, I went out to uh, L.A. to uh, visit a friend, and um, you know, it's gorgeous, it's sunny, yeah. it's beautiful. The people are beautiful. It smells nice. It looks not everything is yeah. like aesthetically perfect. Uh, it seems like paradise. Yeah. And my wife and I are out there, and at the end of the week, we're like, yeah, I'm kind of ready to come home now. Like this, this doesn't feel like home. It doesn't feel quite um, authentic to me. So uh, I don't know something about this place. Maybe it's something in the water. But most uh, most people around here, for some reason, despite the cold, despite the all its uh, downsides or something homey about it. So are most of your friends from high school back back here still? Yeah, yeah. Really? Do you still hang out with them? Um, not like many guys. I'll touch base every like two years, and it's as, as if we've never lost yeah. contact. But uh, yeah, but it's, we're so busy that's uh, you know yeah. with family and the business and you know all, all this stuff. It's hard to make time for that. But uh, what's your college friends? Are they here too? Um, yeah, yeah, they're for the most part, yeah, all within like an hour or two. Again, to the point of, you know, I went to college up in Allentown, so everyone kind of stayed around here within an hour or two, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, Chicago is kind of the same. Like, everyone kind of comes back to Chicago. Mm -hmm. The thing I like about that is somebody knows you somewhere, so you can't bullshit. You can't have a story. Uh -huh. Like, when you go to LA and New York, you can be whatever you want, or DC, uh -huh. you can be whatever you want. You can uh -huh. make up a story, but you can't really do that in Chicago. I bet Philadelphia is kind of the same. Yeah, oddly enough, I think I told you this before, I've never been to Chicago. You've never I've been to never Chicago? I've never been to Chicago. I've you know never... why, don't you? Oh, why is that? I wrote a memo. <laughs> I, I gave it to the mayor. I'm sorry. <laughs> it comes out. All right. yeah. yeah, it's um, but uh, Chicago. My impression, having met a fair number of Chicagoans, is that the yeah, right word? Yeah. Is that they're authentic people as well? Yeah. I think there's something about growing up. You know, certainly in the Northeast corridor, Philly, New York, Boston. It's a gritty kind of cold. Yeah. Um, you know, during the winter, it's a severe existence, and the same for yeah. Chicago, and it's beautiful in the summers. But I think that dose of pain in the form of cold and snow and drudgery once a year. Or keeps people more grounded. Do you think it makes people work a little harder? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I think it. I think it makes people a little bit tougher, a little bit more resilient, a little bit thicker skin, um, maybe a little bit more combat, combative, a little bit more um, opinionated. Yeah, that's just part of the. Uh, certainly around Philadelphia, um, coming from an Italian American family, we love to argue and debate and yell and you know. Uh, so that's just part of the culture here. It's like yeah. you know, thick skin. Um, in your face attitude, you know, it, and I, I value that. Like, there's something to like having to like get up early in the morning when it's dark out and go and take the bus and stand outside in the cold before you go to school, right? Yeah. If you're in LA and California, you know. No, and, and I've, I've always, in a weird way, appreciated that. Like yeah. in those cold times, it's yeah. freezing, but there's something cool about it that you feel like you're. Well, it's easy alive. to say now on the back end of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, here it comes. You know, we're in the December now. It's about to get bad. But yeah. uh, I, again, I look. If it were summer all the time. I don't think I'd be, uh, I'd get bored. I like the yeah. variety of everything in life and seasons included. So you come from a big Italian family or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you mean by big? I don't know. It's just like, you know, you have the get togethers or cousins everywhere and yeah. uncles after a couple glasses of wine to sleep on the couch. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, just kind of that prototypical, stereotypical. Uh, How many cousins do you have? 
I don't know, it's, it's, I don't know, dozens, I would say. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's over the years it, things dwindled down. But uh, growing up, there was it was uh, it was holidays were always a, a good time. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I grew up like that too. I have 30 first cousins. Actually, yeah. you know, Otto was one of my first cousins. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we all grew up like brothers and sisters. Uh-huh. It was the best gift I ever had. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something cool about and catching up with your cousins, uh, you know, these days. And, you know, you share that. It was only 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years mm-hmm. ago. Like the growing up together, it's, like, it's, it's, it's as if you're, it was yesterday. So who came over from Italy? Was it your dad, your grandfather? Uh, my grandparents' parents. So my grandparents came... Uh, my my grandparents' parents were the ones that actually came over yeah. in like the 1920s or such. Yeah. So you still have a lot of the Italian um, traditions in your family? Um, they're, they're admittedly, they are dwindling down, which is yeah. a shame. Um, but, uh, you know, my grandparents all spoke Italian. But at that time, it was, uh, you know, everyone wanted to Americanize their kids and you know, assimilate, which was good right. in many ways. But it's a huge bummer in the fact that we don't, you know, my parents don't speak Italian. I don't speak Italian. Um, right. I would love to. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was just part of the mindset back then is to become more American and, you know, you're all in for America, which is great, but it has its downsides. When I was a kid, you know, my dad's from Morocco, which uh-huh. we didn't know. We thought he was from French. Uh-huh. We thought he was from France <laughs> because he would speak French. And we were, we were kind of told, this is America, you speak English. Uh-huh. And we were taught not to speak like French or Arabic. We want they want us to speak English. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah, and they were real insistent on it. It's kind of interesting because like yeah. today, it's like everyone's like so proud of their ethnicity. But back then, yeah. it was like, no, we're American. Yeah. I mean, it's got pros and cons when everyone yeah. was, you know, all English, all American, you know, it's, uh, there's a certain um, cohesiveness to the culture, but uh, right. you're losing out on the, you know, on, on things like language and customs, which, like I mentioned, are becoming less and less with, with each generation. So did your family push you towards medicine? Was it, you know, like a lot of the immigrant families, although you're not necessarily an immigrant family, but it kind of feels like that when you're... Nah, they, 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 come, they came from that, um, you know, that mindset. Um, yeah. Certainly didn't push me, but, um, uh, you know, when it came time to decide, you know, I was 16, 17 years old at that point, yeah. it was either art school or, you know, they you know, they didn't certainly didn't force me into medicine, but... Um, I didn't, I was listless. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, oh, I'll be an artist or a cartoonist or something. And of course that prompts a certain degree of concern. Um, like how are you going to make ends meet? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, they didn't, um, they certainly didn't push me in that direction, but I kind of ended up there because I did well, though I loved art and drawing and painting and all that stuff, I was again, listless. I didn't have any idea how I was going to make money on it or with it. So, but you really thinking like that when you were like 16, 17, I guess, it, you know, at time to go to college, yeah, because yeah. they were going to foot the bill for college. I go, like, oh, what are we going to do? So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, the good news, I mean, I enjoyed science as well and, and math. Were you a good student? Um, pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I, didn't intellectually blossom probably into my my early twenties, but I was a good student, um, and uh, but at the time, you know, I was good enough at science and math where medical, you know, going pre med was an option, and that's the way I went because I saw some, you know, some um, documentary or such about cleft lip repair, and I thought, wow, this is really cool, Pe- working with your hands. It's artistic in a way. I like science. It was a determined career path. It seemed all laid out in front of me as opposed to this big nebulous gray. Right. You know, was, you know what, what was I going to do with art? I had no idea. So but you know, it's interesting. It's like when you're a kid, there's like art, and then there's science, and the two like just don't mix. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're a kid, and if you kind of go art, you're like, well, we, we don't like those science people. Those people are sitting in the those classes, the biology and the physics and the science class, and the art kids are sitting in different areas and they're hanging out with different people. Where were you like in that milieu of like the art kids or the science kids or? I was definitely in the, or the, the sports kids. kids were you, yeah. I mean, <laughs> certainly not sports kids. Um, uh, I was terrible at sports. I, w- I was always an art kid. Yeah. So I liked hanging out with like the, the misfits and, you know, the kind of nerds. And they were just more interesting people. The like, misfits me, and the nerds. Yeah. The art, yeah. Uh, they were more interesting people. I've, uh, I've never really... The idea of the in crowd, maybe because I was, wasn't was a part of it really, like it never really appealed to me. It just seemed a little bit superficial. A little bit What's pro- the in crowd? Was it, it wasn't the science kids, was it? No, no. It was like, you know... The sports, um, sports the jocks. Sports, yeah. sports, jocks student council kind of stuff yeah. um it just seemed insincere and performative and i'm I, I sure never, you weren't just jealous it, but maybe maybe a little bit sure at that time you know because this jock because we're getting all the girls yeah, and they're like, like the stars well, of the look, show. i'll tell you this like i was you know even if i was a bit nerdier or more in the you know chess and theater and all that the art class i went to art class instead of gym class um even if I was a bit nerdier, I hoped the same for my kids. I got two boys, they're three and five. And if I could, of course, I want them to do whatever's going to make them happy. But if I right. could prescribe their path for them, it would be going the way I did. Like, you know, not in the in crowd, not popular, because that's when you have to suddenly become, 
you know, you have to develop other things, you know, your wit, your intelligence, your creativity. Um, and I, they, I don't know, they, they, the misfits and outsiders have always appealed to me. I would 10 times out of 10 rather be a weirdo misfit outsider than some cool kid wearing the fashionable clothes and driving the coolest car. That has no appeal to me whatsoever. So do you detest it or it doesn't appeal to you? Um, a little bit, but it certainly doesn't appeal to me. And right. I detest it a little bit because there's so much insincerity to it. At the end of the day, who right. gives a shit what, you know, what brand name is blazoned across your chest right. or what kind of car you're driving. It's like, really, this stuff doesn't matter to me. Um, and, so, and look, I have plenty of friends who are car enthusiasts and they work hard all their lives and they're going to buy some supercar or something. Right. Great. Good for them. Enjoy. If that's your passion, great. But I find so many people are doing these things to impress people that, you know, just to, to look better than other people or to impress other people. And I, that, that doesn't appeal to me at all. Tell me about what would your high school friends say about you? Like if I asked what was Chris, Christian Subio like in high school, what would they say? Um, I, I guess like, you know, funny, um, quirky, um, fun, maybe, um, different. I think different. Um, I remember one kid wrote in my yearbook, you know, Hey, I, I please keep in touch. I got to know what you're like when you're 40 because I, so again, so I think I was just, you know, I, I pride myself on that a little bit different. Um, yeah. not the coolest, but different. And I'll, and that's, that's what I think they would say. Interesting. I value interesting people. So I aspire to be an interesting person. And then, so you were thinking about art school and then you make a deviation, go to, you go towards science and medicine. I mean, it's kind of establishment, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, if I could, it's funny, if I could redo it these days, professionally speaking, because right now I am very happy, beautiful wife, beautiful children. I love my life. So I wouldn't change any of that, but in some, you know, in some, uh, alternate, alternate universe, if I could have all that, and have gone and tried out a different path, I think I would have gone the art school path or the film school path or to have tried stand-up comedy in New York City for a year or two or three. Um, I, I've always, that, that will be the itch that I will forever not have scratched and that's kind of why I do a lot of what I do on social media is like a little way for me to, to express myself in that regard. Do you think all that art background and training makes you better what you do today? Yeah, I really do. And that certainly does not mean that one needs to be able to draw or paint or airbrush or do any of the stuff to be a good surgeon. Yeah. There are most surgeons, most brilliant surgeons cannot, you know, draw anything impressive on paper or paint a watercolor. So it's by no means a necessity, but it's a different route to get to the same point B. So I think that really helped me to, to get to the same point. Okay. B but does the creative background that you have, does it help you as a surgeon, when you're actually in the operating room and you're trying to look at facially the, the patient as you're as you're treating them, making them more aesthetically, you know, pro, you know appropriate, or is it that that creative, that creative skill set you have makes you better as a physician looking at patients and understanding the the, the business and the whole concept of aesthetic medicine? I, I think both. Yeah. Um, in that, you know, I think everything that I am good at, and we're all good at different things. The things I am good at is because of creativity. I think creativity is the underpinning to, you know, to the way you relate to a patient. Can yeah. you be creative in expressing a certain concept that might be difficult for her to understand? Can you be um, creative in the approach when you right. look at her? Like in the OR, can you be creative in finding a solution to a problem? Um, in learning organic chemistry? Can you be creative in picturing molecules moving around? So um, it's in social media. Can you be creative in making the content? So I think, you know, one, the thing, the gift for which I am most appreciative, and again, we all have different gifts, is creativity because I think it can be, creativity can be applied in many different ways. I totally agree with you. Like, I think that the fact that your background, I think is what makes you successful today. Like, I really believe that if you follow that track and you go straight through, it actually hinders you. Because you yeah. just only follow those rules all the time. You never think outside the box. You uh -huh. never look at an article differently. You never look at a situation differently. And I think that you actually don't really make a difference. I mean, I think you can, yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. I think it's easy to be good enough at many things, right. uh, medicine, surgery included. And I think that, you know, you could be an, a very adequate or even a good surgeon without any creativity whatsoever, yeah. but you can't be great or exceptional. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying that I am, but I'm saying I aspire to be, and whenever I do have success, I think it's because of that, like you said, the, the ability to think outside the box. All right, tell me about, um, how'd you get the plastic surgery? Was that a natural course for you because of your of your creative background? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's the only reason I went yeah. to medical school, I mean, in pre-med in college. So when I was 17, choosing what I was going to do, that's when I figured art school or med school. And so I was like, oh, 
Plastic surgery seems like a cool thing to do, so I went to college knowing I would be pre-med with the aim of being a plastic surgeon. Really? Yeah, so thank God it worked out because I say... That's uh, not so easy. No, it, That's I, a roll of the dice. I had no idea of what it would take to get to that point B, how hard it was, how many years it would take. I, I had no idea. Uh, my family, my, my parents didn't go to college. We didn't have doctor friends. We didn't Same go thing. in those circles. So I had no idea what an internship was or a residency or what it took to get into medical school or uh, any of this stuff. Do you think naivety is bliss there? Oh, yeah. I mean, cause, yeah. again, if you told me and laid it out for me, I wouldn't have done it. Right. Really. So, um, so yeah, but again, I'm, I'm, I've gotten to a point B. I'm very happy now in that, you know, I have a, you know, a, a great practice, a great family, great wife, great kids. And with social media, I'm able to scratch all those itches to some degree of, of, of creating things, of drawing things, of doing humor, all, all those other, all, all the create, creative things that I wasn't doing 10 years ago before social media came out and I was miserable. I now get to do that. And that was like the last key to my happiness. So when you were as a resident, like you're really, you're, you're working your butt off, you're up all night long. You're certainly not getting a chance to be, or to express your creative gene. You're like, what the hell am I doing? Oh yeah, I was I was miserable. I was miserable <laughs> in residency, um, first couple of years out as an attending, um, because yeah, I mean, I went from in high school drawing and art, and th that was my thing. And then in college, it was my thing. And then in medical school, it wasn't my thing so much. And then in residency, it just didn't do it at all. I went from producing yeah. all this art and, and and creative output to nothing, and then and that was for many many years. And I was like, I didn't. Even, oh, he must have felt so empty and like. Oh yeah, but I didn't even. Like, you're so busy, you don't even realize why it's happening, why you're unhappy. I was just kind of going along the motions like a shell of a person, yeah. um, not really. You know, I wasn't thinking. Oh, I need to draw some more because you don't have time to think that you're working a hundred hours a week. Um, so, so yeah, thank God, thank God I made it to in this field of plastic surgery that has allowed me the creativity to do these things. But then you, you go into a further rabbit hole and you go into micro, micro surgery. Yeah. I mean, like nothing's making sense to what you're saying. It's like, no. why wouldn't you like go out and start doing cosmetics right away? You go into micro surgery, reconstructive surgery. You're spending hours under the microscope. I mean, it's really tedious. What was that angle? Just, I just got caught along the current of my career path. Um, and um, I, I think maybe some bad advice and maybe just not really thinking about things. I didn't know. It's all, all was a, a questionable future, lots of risks and, you know, okay, well, if you do a fellowship, that's what I heard, then it's going to be easier to get a, um, a career, maybe a job yeah. at a hospital or a job doing X, Y, or Z. Yeah. If you go out on your own, that's risky. You know how hard it is to make it on your own. So people telling you you can't do it. Um, uh, it's it, between those two paths. After having worked all the best years of your life towards this goal, yeah. you, I, to some degree, wanted to stick with what was given and safe and uh, just safe, not risky. But I see a dichotomy here, and I, I, I could be wrong, but yet you follow these traditional paths or you respect these traditional paths of like medicine and microsurgery and advice from some of these elders and traditions of a family and your history. And then like you have the, the fuck you part, which is like, I don't want anything with the establishment and I'm a misfit and I'm different. You, you kind of like skirt both of those, don't you? Well, I think that was due to, you know, my, my, my nature is more of a counterculture, you know, contrarian kind of misfit kind of like in high school. And then I got drug along this path of med school, residency. But you, you chose it. I did, yeah, but it was all because it seemed that was the only way forward. After well, why was like, it the only way forward? Because it was like being in a in a gambling situation in a in a casino. It's like what did I say? Bad money after good. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You throw good bet, money after you bad. Bet again, you bet again. You put all this time in, and like, well, oh, shit. I guess I got to keep going. Yeah, but are you pleasing your parents or yourself? Like, why are you uh, doing it? At the, I don't know. I, was, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. It was. It's just yeah. a dumb answer, and you might be like, why didn't you stop and think about this? Um, and it certainly wasn't to, to please them. Like, um, you know, they were happy. They just wanted to see me happy. But, um, so I've just, again, I was in this current yeah. of just work, work, work. Um, and so during all these years, as you well know, the, 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 um, the culture of surgical residency and surgical training, they're beating you down. Yeah. And people who knew me in residency, like they see me today, like that was like, what? Because I was so quiet. I was so respectful and I still am respectful. I value, I value, 
um, you know, experience and rank and file. Um, I was just very respectful, speak when spoken to, but during that time, just very resentful of the fact that I was miserable and I'm dealing with these personalities of these assholes, yeah. these egotistical assholes and academics who are, you know, shitting on everyone and treating people like shit, treating the nurses like God shit. God complex a little God bit, right? Complexes. With some of these doctors. So I think a lot of my irreverence toward this industry is I, look, I've made it through the storm and now I'm like, fuck you guys. I am like, I am no more. I am, I have my own business now. And this is very important to me where I don't work for the hospital anymore. I can do what I want. I can advertise how I want. I can say what I want. And I value my freedom of expression after having having, you know, 15 years of my life where I was stifled. Um, Cause you also worked for the hospital right when you came out. Mm -hmm. So that's, once again, you're under that microscope. Yeah. Yeah. And it, Why'd you do that? A safe, easy, uh, option? safe, safe and easy. Yeah. Because again, like this, this whole, this idea in, in, at least in my surgical residency and my experience coming up through academia, it was that academics were all that mattered and cosmetics was kind of like this frou-frou field that wasn't right. as important. And, you know, so I think they kind of dissuaded you from doing that. So your professors kind of looked down upon you because you had this creative angle or no, thoughts. I, mean, I didn't even have the, I didn't express the creative angle at that time. I was just doing what they said and doing the cases, trying to do my best, trying to, you know, trying to succeed along that path. Right. But no one really, no one encourages you along to a, yeah, uh, of course, towards aesthetics, aesthetics yeah. because it's a lesser field, so they say. But then, so you go into microsurgery, then you come out <laughs> and then you're working at the hospital. Are you doing like free flaps? Oh yeah. So bilateral, the IEP flaps. Which is some of the most complex, difficult surgery to do in plastic surgery. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, these are like 12 hour, you know, there's like 12 hour cases, um, you know, 14 hour cases sometimes. If there are some, some of them, 10 hours in, you have a problem and it fails. Um, and uh, so the, uh, you know, and then, then you're on call the next night and then you're rounding the next Like People don't understand that no one wants to hear a cosmetic surgeon complain about how tough they had it or what they went through, but it was grueling. It was grueling. Yeah. So when you're doing that and you're under the microscope, you're up all night long, you're not sleeping, I ever like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, but at that point, like you're so ensconced in this world, like what am I gonna do? Just quit and open up like a, you know, it's, that would be such a U-turn, such but a you did it. degree. I, I tried to do it in a way, once I realized I was, I was going to take the plunge, then I'm like, okay, let me do this intelligently. So I tried to quickly, i.e. over two or three years, get an off-ramp out of this. And so part-time down in the suburbs of Philly where I grew up um, and away from the hospital where I was working like an hour away. So, Did you know you were going to do that? Like yeah, you were, you were going to partition yeah, off? And, uh, yeah. At some point I'm like, you know, I, and I, I have to try. I have to try. Um, and if I'm miserable and I fail, then so what? I'm, I'm miserable anyway, so why not try? What did your family and friends think when you said, you know what, I'm going off on my own? Oh, they were thrilled because my, my parents knew that I'd be back around here and closer to home. And they, of course, they had always the utmost confidence that whatever I choose, I will succeed. And, um, you know, they, they were a big factor in, you know, in uh, encouraging me and giving me the confidence that you could do it. You always succeed in everything you do. So um, they, they were big. Uh, they were big. And did, so then you go off on your own. And mm -hmm. it's, I mean, that's a huge challenge, oh, yeah. risk. Difficult. What yeah. were you thinking at that point? It's definitely scary um, because I remember I interviewed when I was trying to get privileges at the hospitals around here. I I, I talked to one physician um, who at the time was um, you know higher up in the hospital. He's like, now look, uh, you know you can try to come around here, but you have to be aware there's a lot of competition. So you know you have a good <laughs> thing going on. I'm like I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, what am I doing? I just yeah. took a loan out, you know. So. Um, but it, yeah, it was scary, but, um, but fun and exciting. And I felt, even though it was scary, I knew in my heart of hearts that I was doing the right thing because I, I, I sensed, I smelled the freedom and the creativity that, that lied ahead in, um, lied or laid, um, <laughs> that, that was, uh, ahead in, um, in not just the work, but in the creating of a, uh, the creation yeah. of a business. Are you entrepreneurial? Um, Yes and no. I'm entrepreneurial in the big surprise, the creative aspects of it in the, oh my God, I want to come up with a new way to advertise or a new way to do this or a new way to teach that. So in the creative aspects of it, I'm very entrepreneurial because that's exciting to me when it comes to the nuts and bolts of the running of a business and the uh, managing the profits and losses. Not at all. Like I'm not good at that stuff. It's not my so entrepreneurial and being a businessman are two separate things. 
I guess, you know, the best combine both, but uh, admittedly, my strengths lie in the creative aspect. All right, speaking of combining both, mm -hmm. um, you picked the pizza place. Yes. And you said this is one of Philadelphia's finest. It also happens to be seven minutes from your house. So yes, I'm not sure yeah. if there's a little bias here. It's a Philadelphia thing. You guys are good to your own people. Well, I mean, I realize I'm talking to a Chicagoan, so I'm not going to uh, go out on a limb and make any uh, bold pizza claims. But, uh, <laughs> okay. But, so uh, Anthony's Pizza. Yeah. And uh, what, 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 I got cheese. What, what did you get? I got plain, I believe. Yeah. You got... Oh, I, oh I, I, yeah. I'm going to... Well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a piece of the plane yeah? if I okay, could. Good. All right, so you're Italian, but I'm seeing some Latin roots here to Latin America, Spain. Mm. And I don't know if I told you this, but I'm ten percent Italian. Oh get out. No, I like you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did my twenty three me. Uh huh. Mr. I've never done that. Wait, Sabrina made me do it before we started dating. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't think you trusted me. And she <laughs> took my funny. passport, too. But I don't... <laughs> anyway, that's a longer story. Um, so I found my 23 me, and I'm 10% Italian, and I'm 35% North African, and I have about 7 or 8% of Iberian Peninsula. But I was able to follow my family tree far back enough that I was able to get um, uh, Portuguese and Spanish citizenship. That's really cool. Yeah, I got you passports. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yep. I want to hear something funny. Yeah. I just got named as one of the top Latino doctors in America. Get out. <laughs> See? In serio? Yeah. That's in serio. Great. Yeah. So I'm getting the plaque and everything. So once I became a Spanish, uh, uh, Hispanic, I guess. Get uh, out. And now I have uh, my, uh, our son is going to have four different passports because That's he's Ecuadorian. You know, Sabrina's Ecuadorian uh -huh. and then American and Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm yeah. afraid to do the 23andMe thing just in case one day I need to commit a crime. I'm afraid <laughs> it's going to be... I'll be if you trace back to me. You know, I like to keep my options yeah. open. Okay, but I'll tell you something. If you decide to commit a crime, not that I'm giving any advice to anyone, Ecuador is the one place in the world that doesn't have extradition rights with oh, the U.S. All right, there There's a go. couple other countries, but okay. I figured that out when I had to go sign the papers for our son to have an Ecuadorian passport. I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you're, so you're, tell me about your background. So you're Italian, Ecuadorian, and then you went well, no, to I'm Spain. Not uh, no, no, I'm your, your sister-in-law is Ecuadorian, just... but you went to Spain and you spent yeah. time in Spain. And mm -hmm. then I know you went down to South America to do cleft lip and palate. Mm -hmm. So I've done, I've done a couple trips in Ecuador and a couple, um, trips in, um, in Peru. Peru. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and they were amazing. Like, and I've done, so I think like seven trips altogether. I wish I did more, but at this point, you know, I, I, it's been a while since I've done my cleft lip portion of my training. So at this point, I'm too rusty to be delivering the best of care in that regard. So I've stopped doing them so much. Well, why did you do it? Um, I don't know. And this is, this is, you went and you did reconstructive work, cleft lip and palate yeah. for kids who can't afford this surgery down in uh, yeah. South America oh, it was, or it was Latin America. It was such an amazing experience. I mean, once you do one of those trips, it's like you have to do another because it is so amazing. You go Rewarding. There, it's rewarding. It is humbling. It makes you realize, you know, how good we have it here and to shut up and stop complaining. But you go down there and these people, they're, they're coming from like, you know, hundreds of miles away sometimes, like coming down like eight hour trips on, on a donkey from the mountains. Like it's, it's crazy. They will show up and the first day you go there, it's a packed gymnasium in a, uh, in a, in a grade school. And there's hundreds of people waiting there, hoping that they can get surgery for their kids. And some of them have cleft lips and some of them have hand deformities. And some of them have had, you know, uh, boiling water spilled from a cooking accident as a child and their heads fused to their shoulder, all this stuff. And so it's rewarding because you're able to do these things for these people who, who would not otherwise. So when care. you fly to South America or Latin yeah. America to do these surgeries, do you get paid to do it? No, no. Um, so why do you do it? Because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're pretty lucky, right? So it's like, why not? Like, um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds so cliche, but giving back a little bit where I feel very fortunate, very blessed, very lucky in so many regards that, um, to, to, you know, to do something nice for some other people is, is again, just rewarding. So, um, so I'd like to do more. How does that influence your practice today? Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it grounds me in that, um, if someone has a complication, if, um, or if someone is, um, you know, their, their self-concept confidence is shot and I can talk, to, it, it helps me put things into perspective. If I have a complication, which otherwise, and it's going to keep me up all night anyway, but I'm like, calm down. It's a, you know, it's a wound. It, this, this person will get better. 
they this is they are still the luckiest people on earth we are still the luckiest people yeah. on earth this is not bad we do not have it bad even if someone has a complicated and I, and I do not mean to minimize anyone's complications of course. um but or if someone comes in and, and she is super concerned with something on her face or on her body or breast or something i think it informs the way i talk to her in that you have to find a way to not be dismissive of those concerns but let, let uh, look you look beautiful there's so many things that can go wrong with a person's body that like look you're healthy you're beautiful it helps me it informs the way i kind of put things in perspective for them as well i think that's the biggest takeaway for me from those trips is you know it opens your eyes to the what is happening outside of our American bubble here. Yeah. Tell me how you, um, so your patients today that come to you, how do they, how do they get to you? Um, you Word know, of mouth, social media. It's funny, a couple years ago, it was vast majority of social media, which I never thought would be the case. Um, you know, we're talking like you know, 75% of the patients where I saw you on Instagram or, you know, I watched a lecture of yours on Instagram or I liked your funny videos on Instagram. So I figured yeah. I'd give you a shot, which isn't always the best idea to find a doctor via their uh, funny videos. But um, you know, it, it used to be mostly Instagram, but now word of mouth has caught up, but still social media still matters because even if it is word of mouth, like, oh, and check out his Instagram and then they'll go to the Instagram. They'll see my results. They'll see me teach. They'll see my, you know, videos that I'm not taking myself too seriously. Um, and I'm relatable. Um, and they come in the door and I'm no, no longer selling to them. They already know me. They trust me. And I've already credentialed myself. All right. So one thing I want to get into with you, and one of the reasons I'm here is because I think you are a creative genius and uh, go my on opinion. now. No. Thank yeah, you. I, <laughs> your social media is fantastic, but it's beyond just fantastic. A lot of people have great social media, but you really do a lot of creative, innovative things that no one else has ever done before. How much of that did you start out out of necessity to get busy in practice? And how much of that was like, God, I just need an outlet for my creative In the know, beginning, it was mostly passion. just an outlet. Um, and uh, I thought it would harm me, uh, frankly, because not a lot of people at that time were doing right. fun stuff. And this is only five, six years ago, seven years ago. Like, but the, the landscape has really changed in just that short time. So at that time, people weren't doing funny things or TikTok dances or things like that. Um, and it was very much frowned upon. So, but even still, I'm like, ah, I don't care. I just need to do it. I need to, you know, it, that's part of my personality. I like humor. I like, um, you know, uh, sketch comedy. I like that kind of, I like filmmaking, amateur. Um, so when I did it, I thought these people, this is not going to resonate. People are going to want a serious, you know, that what they, uh, this idea of a surgeon that, that they have in their head and if anything, this may hurt me, but that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll weather the storm somehow. And I did it. And it resonated with people and they, you know, it just... Well, some people, do you think it resonates with everyone? Most people, or at least the people that I want to be dealing with. Right. Like everyone mm -hmm. has their, their crowd, everyone has their tribe. Um, and the tribe that I want is people that are, you know, they're fun and they're intelligent and they're, they're, they question things and they don't take themselves too seriously. And, uh, and they, you know, they appreciate good, honest advice and they have natural expectations. They don't want to look like some plastic Barbie doll. These are the people that, you know, that, that these are my values and my aesthetic ideals. So they, you know, again, you find your tribe and there's some doctors out there who deliver that, you know, gigantic, you know, um, uh, you know, Barbie, Barbie, Bobby, uh, bar, uh, Barbie yeah. body proportions or faces which are, you know, super Kardashianified, and that's fine. Everyone can find what they want. My particular aesthetic is more natural, and people who are more real people, not the okay. But every plastic surgeon that I meet says I'm natural. Mm -hmm. So you're not you're not any different than anyone else when you say that. Uh, well, you are different is your social media is so far superior to everyone else creatively. So you go out and you start doing this social media. Are you worried about losing, like, do you lose patients out of it? Like, because your creative medium becomes the social media and you're doing stuff that's that's um, very different than everyone else, but you didn't care. No, and if anything, if I did lose patients, I didn't notice it because I was growing so rapidly at the same time. So, so uh, the net was just a massive gain. Yeah. So in the end, I'm like, you know, once I started to have some success with them, fuck it, I'm just gonna lean into it. And, and I did and continued to have more So success. does the real Christian Subio come out on social media? Um, yeah, I mean, to an extent. I mean, I, I, I think some people see my irreverent kind of in your face kind of uh, combative. Like some of it is persona. Some of it is, um, you know, an idealized version of myself. Uh, uh, some of it's just silliness. Like, so it's, um, it's, it's not the, the portions of it are the real me. It, it's all authentic. None of it is, is, uh, yeah, that's a great way of putting it, you know, but you have these two, you have these alter personalities, tuck daddy. 
And you have, uh, I saw another one, Emo Subio. Oh, yeah, these are all, these are all, <laughs> which know, people have to see if they haven't seen it. Yeah. I, it's almost like, it's almost like SNL skits. If yes. I can liken it to anything. And like, you know, the stupid little characters that are recurring on SNL. Yes. And that's just testament to the fact that I love comedy. I love humor. Yeah. I love, which is an, an art form. It really is. I truly believe it's one of the, the coolest art forms because it combines intelligence and creativity and absurdity. So, um, when I do those characters, it just, funny silly stuff and it, but it resonates with people they seem to like it and i think it's funny and the people that comment and come to see me think it's funny i too. was in the airport this morning watching it and i was laughing out loud and all the people around me like what's he laughing at i'm uh, like sorry <laughs> uh, yeah it's, it's I, I, fantastic that's to my ears because i love uh you know it's um it's uh, i i want to do more of that and like i said in another life maybe i'll uh you know if i come back as something else so I'll, you know a lot of people are going to look at this and they're going to say well you know oh, gee, i can't be like i can't do that what do you say to that? I tell people this all the time. You can, we all have, um, you know, maybe not everyone has a, a comedic talents. We all have different talents. You know, one of my, a couple of talents that I have, one of them is comedy, I think. Um, everyone is funny to some degree, though. When I tell people, when I talk about social media, is there are funny things that happen to every one of us every day. Right. Every day you go to the office and you have a, you know, a full list of patients, there are funny things that happen or some patients say f something funny to you or you're talking with your assistant and she says something fun. There are funny things that happen every day. I think part of the um, talent of comedy, stand-up comics or, or sketch comics or whatever, is being able to identify those things and realize it and capture it and then do something with it. So, you know, you don't have to be, you know, Eddie Murphy or, you know, Chris Rock or you, you can have funny things that happen to you on a daily basis and you just have to identify and use it. So how much time does it take you a day with social media? Like most people are like, well, you know, I don't have time for social media. Um, you know, I can't, I can't believe Christian Subio because I just don't have the time to do it. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, especially the busier I've gotten with the with the business and with patients, um, I have less time for that. But like I mentioned earlier to you, um, um, I'm I'm going to take on less patients. I'm going to cut down my clinical hours to make time, more time for that for myself. Because there are weeks that I go now where I don't post something. And at the end of those weeks, I'm very much, ah, damn it, I didn't post anything. Yeah, I had a you know, 100 whatever injectables and surgeries. I don't care though. I want to do those things. They make me very happy. So it's a constant push-pull with me trying to find the time to do those things. Um, and I will always, oftentimes people will comment after I do a particularly um, well-polished video, some will be like, you have too much time on your hands. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing. Like, it's just jealousy, make, don't you think? I don't know. Like, but whatever. I'll let people decide right. that. But, you know, it's like it, that stuff is important to me. I will make time for that because everyone has hobbies. I don't golf. I don't yacht. I don't play tennis. I don't ski. I don't do any of that. My happy place is making funny content. And that's... Uh, that's is my, that your happy place? Like yeah. if you got paid nothing, would you do it? Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Professionally, you know, my happy places are spending time, personally, spending time with my family and professionally um, doing the creative stuff. I just love that stuff. It's just so fun. And when I see it makes people happy or I get comments, oh, my God, I really needed this today. And these are stupid. I make no mistake. I, I realize these are stupid little videos I'm doing. But when someone comments like something like that, it makes me very happy. Like it's a you've kind of affected someone. You brought a smile to someone on a given day. And that's so I believe millions of people should be watching this. Let's say tomorrow Netflix comes to you and says, Christian, your stuff is brilliant. It's great. We want to have your own show. We want to create a show around you. Oh, yeah. I would love that. I mean, if it's done correctly because, uh, you know, number one, that's never going to happen. But if it ever did happen, you know, you see so many versions of these Netflix shows. Everyone thinks it's cool. Oh, my God, I want a show. I want a show. But, like, you want it done right. You know, sometimes these shows are a little bit off the wall or a little bit, um, they, they, they minimize the... Um, our profession or, or they, they, I, I would want a lot of creative control over something like this, which is probably another reason why it won't happen. What would the show be? Uh, I don't know. I've, uh, I've pitched one before, um, of traveling around almost like a Anthony Bourdain type and, you know, visiting doctors all around and seeing what plastic surgery happened, what crazy stuff you've seen the crazy stuff that people do all around the world. Um, I think that's really interesting. It would combine travel. People love travel yeah. and they love plastic surgery and yeah. they love oddities which yeah. is why uh, botched is you know they love the whole freak show aspect of the show botched um so you combine that all into one with a traveling uh, with a travel bent i think that'd be pretty that's a show i would want to watch and that's what i would I agree yeah. what would be your ideal uh, week for you 
Um, like some surgery, some yeah. creativity, you know, I think travel. Be one day of, um, you know, of course weekends for family, it would be one day of surgery, one day of doing injectables. And of course you'd have to do the pre-ops, post-op consults on another day. So three days of clinical. And then I think one day of creating content and one day of creating teaching. So like teaching, uh, like injectable stuff. Yeah. I like that. I like that teaching injectables. How about teaching surgery? Nah. I mean, uh, it's, you know, when people ask me how I got into teaching injectables, I think it's because I, you know, I have an aversion to many of my colleagues. Um, so many surgeons are very pompous and very egotistical and they can't learn anything from anyone. It's just like, it's very hard to teach surgeons. I know you do it. I don't know how you've done it, but, um, but for me, I enjoy the, it's like teaching injectables seems like it's a little bit lower stakes. People are a little less hoity-toity um so i've kind of veered in that direction purposefully because it just what if someone says you know christian you're just afraid to go into that arena of uh I don't know, of the I surgeons mean, or you know you're just taking the easy route because no one's going to challenge you it's um i don't know i would sit down and consider that um but i think i don't know it's just not where my passion lies um teaching surgery because you know i think i'm pretty good at tummy tucks i think i could maybe carve out a little niche in teaching some tummy tuck techniques but um, I don't know. I do like injectables. Like I really in, enjoy the. I, I love facial surgery, but I've yeah. veered away from it because people like you, you've dedicated yourself to that. You're better at it than I am. So I'm. I don't. I want to be the best at whatever I do. So I've I veered agree. away from that. But doing injectables has allowed me to keep my hand in facial work. I love the face. It's such a fascinating. When I draw things from when I was a kid, teenager, I was always drawing faces. Faces yeah. are fascinating. So um, it, injectables has allowed me to keep my hands in the in the um, facial aesthetic world. So you, you talk about injectables and how you <clears> like <throat> teaching it, and how much you enjoy it, and I, I feel your passion. But you also give a big flip of the bird to a lot of the industry folks. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile those two things? Um, I I enjoy teaching the you know the clinicians, um, the younger nurses, doctors, uh, PAs, whatever. I, I enjoy teaching. The providers um, industry is um, they of course have their hand in everything there's good to it and there's bad to it I think unfortunately these days they're the bad portion of industry is growing a bit too quickly in comparison with the good um, it's just uh, okay you got to go deeper on that because you're gonna say the bad portion what do you mean yeah, what's I mean, bad about the industry bias I mean industry is it's an industry it's a it's a for-profit they have a profit endeavor. motive they have these are multi some of them are billion, multi-billion dollar companies with stockholders and, you know, they're, uh, they need to, they're, they're a business. They're designed to make money and that is not always in line with the interest of the patients. As providers, our interests always have to be, you know, patients first. Industry has to be stockholders first or making money first. That's what they do. And they may say otherwise, but call me cynical, but I think, you know, their priority is making money and I don't fault them for that. I fault more... I fault more the providers who allow the industry to, to um, to dictate how they uh, you know the truths that they uh, that they teach. Okay, so when you talk about these providers, industry has to teach based on FDA labels. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the way they teach is best practices? In other words, do you think the way they teach gets the best outcomes? Um, Remember, they're restricted. They have to teach based on FDA labels, so they don't have much latitude in the way they teach. Um, I, I didn't know it's about the way they, it's about the restrictions on how they teach. I think it's about their goals, um, in that, you know, that they have to make money. So if they're going to come out with a product, they're going to say that it does X, Y, and Z, even if it doesn't, it, even if it doesn't do that, they will come up with studies to, um, to, it's a confirmation bias. They will, they will design studies to confirm the result that they want. So it's, it's even before it gets to the teaching of things, they, the, the way they design these products and advertise them, um, it's just, uh, it's not, it's not valid in many. Because you think that they're, they're, I, I hear you, the confirmation bias going towards it to say it does collagen stimulation or it lasts for 10 years, whatever they want to say, they'll, oh. they'll find the study to prove that. Exactly. Yeah. But they can't teach that unless the FDA gives them approval on that. And the doctors that they pay money to, to teach it have to stay on label. It's have weird. to teach what they're finding in their studies is. It's weird because if you think back a couple of years, like 10 years ago now, a certain product, it, its whole advertising campaign was that it lifted jowls. And if you injected it into the cheeks, it would lift jowls. So I don't know. Um, but the companies don't say that. 
somehow this is where it gets weird because right. it's like they they find a way to pay the the KOLs, the spokes. KOL being key opinion leader. Key opinion leaders. These are the paid spokespeople, the companies who aren't always obviously paid. The average yeah. person doesn't understand this, but these are being paid a lot of money by the companies. So even though that wasn't maybe in the FDA study. The company somehow this this message trickles down outside of these paths to you know the message becomes at these trainings oh the filler is going to lift the face and look it's going to put it here it's going to lift the jaw it doesn't do that the, the the research doesn't say that they're not saying that on their commercials or on their handouts yeah. or inserts yeah. but all their trainers and providers are saying that so but so if the trainers and I hear you on this but the trainers and providers are saying that they can't say it while they're being paid by the companies to say that, but outside of them being paid by the companies, you think they say that? And they're just known as a key opinion leader for that company? It, here's where it gets so much messier because yeah. they're oftentimes not just for that one company, but they're being paid by multiple companies. Right. And they'll go to, uh, the, the messages just become signals crossed, the message becomes muddied and obfuscated, and they're, uh, it's, it's just a big confusing mess, and the science goes right out the window. Um, and it all becomes pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is rampant in this industry. Okay, but pseudoscience is rampant in all of history, right? I mean, you can, you can argue back and forth on the vaccines for hours. True. I mean, so that's right. a good example. It's right. very akin to aesthetics, um, where you know it's it's for profit. So pseudoscience is rampant throughout history. Um, I mean, fake but, news is the biggest the biggest headline of 2023. Mm -hmm. But this the aesthetic industry is unique in that this is where it crosses over with commodities, where you're selling of something, where it's now in the beauty industry as if it were a lipstick or an eyeshadow, which is different than you know vaccines and different than, than cardiac product, you know drugs. Um, so it's like this blending of a commodity, you know, a commodity of the beauty industry, where it's like it just it's. Uh, okay, so tell me about the future of aesthetics. Most people will tell you is not non physicians injecting, and that's the majority of injectors right now. Non physicians, mm -hmm. and you have a great appeal with them. Mm -hmm. um, why? Oh, uh, why? Well, number one, I think you know, I think um, it's refreshing to them to hear someone with an MD behind his or her name not saying they can't do it. So number one, you know, they are providers. Some some of the most brilliant providers are nurses, MPs, PAs. Um, and for so long, so many of the old school in our industry have said they can't do it. They shouldn't be doing it. We do it better. It's just this whole dismissive, condescending attitude towards them, which it turns them off immediately. So number one, I think I have some degree of appeal with, um, you know, with with this group because I I respect them, and it's, it's they they appreciate the respect, the recognition that they do some of the most brilliant work out there. Um, so I, I think that's number one, and. Um, that, that's the main thing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I truly do believe that they, um, they really, we can name dozens of nurses, PAs, and MPs who do beautiful work better than many of our surgeon colleagues. So I, I, I do agree with you. I think they are the future of this industry. There, there's no doubt they are. And I, I have a PA now and a nurse practitioner that have been working with me for over, over a decade. And they're both fantastic injectors. And I would put them up against any physician, uh -huh. hands down. They're, uh -huh. they're great. But I'll tell you something, when sometimes they get frustrated by all the students we have coming through now, because we host a program for PAs and nurses and we teach them, and a lot of them want to start injecting right away. We hire them and they're like, I want to inject right now. And both of them, we had a program in place that they had to work with me for six months and they had to meet certain milestones before we let them inject. And every time we get someone that now follows them, they want to inject right away. And they're coming back to me saying, well, you know, they're getting frustrated by that. Well, Do you think here's the problem? And this is, yeah, I, I could go on all day about this, is part of the problem, while I do believe that nurses, PAs, and MPs are brilliant injectors, they're there does need to be some barriers to entry. For you and I, that was the fact that we put in, I know for myself, 15 years of training before I could inject. Um, and uh, I think the with the barriers gone, anyone can inject these days. So while I do believe that the MPs, PAs, and nurses are brilliant injectors, they have to dedicate themselves to put in the time, the training, to go to cadaver courses, to study, to really take this seriously. And I think, again, back to the industry, the industry is capitalizing upon the fact that anyone can inject. They are willing to train anyone to get as many people, you know, holding syringes as possible. Um, so that is the downside 
to um, non-traditional injectors, you know, NPs, PAs, and nurses, some of them, there's a subset, like you said, think that they can just get right into it and bypass all the necessary training. Um, it's, and, and with the years of study comes experience and good judgment and scientific reasoning that I think, you know, that's what I'm always preaching to them when they listen to me, is that, look, you guys want to be the best so you want to be better than the doctors and surgeons, um, then you have to put in the time to respect the science and critical thinking and, um, and, and you know, just taking it seriously. It's not just something that you just pick up, but you take a weekend course or, you know, you do it for a month and now you're ready So how to go. would you credential a nurse, PA, or a MP, a nurse practitioner, how would you credential them to do injections? That's a really good question. I think that is the holy grail of this whole industry. Um, everyone keeps asking me, like, what do we do? Like, what kind of like certification can we have? Or what, what's some unifying school or residency or something that we could do to standardize this process um, for nurses, PAs, and MPs? Um, it, my favorite model of teaching is very much the surgical model, apprenticeship. So I don't know what that looks like in practice, but if I were going to train, I mean, I could train anyone, like you could train anyone. Um, if I were going to bring on a new injector who had never done injectables before, it would start very much like the surgical residency. It wouldn't happen in a month or six months or even a year. I would credential him and her over two or three years. Yeah, but don't you think you have a responsibility to some extent? Like you go up there and you teach how to do injectables to many people who are just getting started. Mm -hmm. They see you and they're like, oh, I think I can do it like him. Do you the have best I can, the way, that's a good question. And the way I view it is that if I don't, I'm just gonna teach them the best I can. If I don't do it right now, I could be a purist and say, I'm not gonna do this unless they train with me for three years. And in that case, they're just gonna find someone else who will teach them shittily, if that's a word, shittily. Um, but so my, my thinking is, if I can teach them as much as I can in as little time, the right way to do things and try to instill in them during my lectures, the importance of doing it safely, the importance of study of anatomy, the importance of you know certain techniques that are gonna minimize their complications. If I can get to them, even if for only an hour or three hours or a, or a, a day at a, at a conference or something, then they're better off than if they've never crossed paths with me. Because if, if not me, someone else is going to teach them some pseudoscientific knowledge Nonsense that's going to get someone's face. But what makes you the the <clears throat> the um, purveyor of, of excellence, and you as you are the curator of the most important knowledge that's that's not pseudoscience, whereas everyone else is teaching pseudoscience. The companies are the KOLs. Why? What well, makes you I'm the not saying expert? I'm the only person. I'm just yeah. saying that there's not as many as I would like of people who are actually critically mm -hmm. thinking and teaching. Yeah, critical thinking is the basis of everything. Yeah. And I've been I'm talking a lot about this recently. So I by no means am the only one. I have a you know, vast network of yourself included. We value you know, critical thinking and you know, logic and reason. I'm just saying that the majority of providers out there do not value it. They're not, they're, it is veered off the path. So there are many of us, and I, th th these are the people, this is my tribe in the industry, people that do question things and want to bring logic and reason. And if, if someone publishes a paper, not just to be, oh my God, evidence-based medicine, this is it. Now I'm gonna inject, no, 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 hold up. Let's examine that paper. Let's like really poke and prod it. Does it make sense? Is it well-designed? Should I change the way I do things based on this? So I'm not the only one, but there is not enough people who are valuing critical thinking I, I think you tell me how you feel about this but mm -hmm. I think medical school teaches you a lot of things it teaches you how to use your hands especially if you're a surgeon it teaches you um, all the pharma pharmacology and the physiology and anatomy but if you ask me what's the most important thing about medical school I would say it's the ability to make a decision to your point critical thinking right uh -huh. you spent nine years or ten years or 15 years getting beaten up but you had to make calls in the middle of the night you make calls when you were tired you had to make a decision at a, at a moment's notice with the best information you have, that to me is what it takes to become a physician today. Yeah, that's, that's a great, I was just talking with a colleague about this recently, like, man, you, I was talking about how hard we had, I'm like an old surgeon already, talking right. about how hard we used to have it with surgical residency. Um, and they're like, well, do you think it was worth it? I'm like, I do think it was worth it because like you said, it hardens you, it toughens you, it, you have to make snap decisions, you, you get tougher, and I think, one thing that distinguishes us surgeons, and which which is why I think we will always have a place in this field, even if NPs, PAs, and nurses kind of take off and, you know, as I expect them to, and I will applaud them when they do, there will always be a place for us because there's something about surgeons that 
Anatomy is the anatomy. You're in the OR, something goes wrong, you just, fuck it, you gotta fix it. It's very cut and dry, you don't have time for bullshit. And so much of this industry is bullshit, that's where I think my surgical training has, really comes into play. Like, yeah. I, I just walk in and other people are like, what about this, and they're, they're talking, oh, no, guys, that's not, what? That's nonsense, I don't have time for that, that's nonsense. Get right, to, right, to, the get right to, the to the point. Okay, but you get up in front of a room of people, and I've done this too, and they may not have those years of training like you have. You can't tell me you get challenged by the room of nurses and practitioners as much as you get challenged by a room of physicians, especially surgeons. And I'm not saying that the surgeons are all right, but they're certainly gonna throw some shame at you. Yeah, and that's that's what I try to convey to everyone else, is that you know um, I want the PAs, nurses, and MPs to, to not just, exactly that point, that's a great point. I find that when a big name MD or DO gets up on the podium, they don't question them enough, maybe because they have an MD behind their name. And I said, no, you guys question them. I don't care. I don't care who it is. If they are the most famous injector in the world, if, and I've done this before, early on in my career, I'm going to make a post about the story I was going to tell uh, with, with Dr. Swift, who I, I love. He's a brilliant man. I remember I'm going to tell the story about how earlier on, one of the first presentations I ever did, I was, he's at the meeting and he said something with which I disagreed. And I'm like, uh, so I, I said something at the podium and I was sweat, like, I was sweaty, I was nervous, and I, he looked up and I, uh, I'm like, oh shit, like Arthur, I, I just disagreed with Arthur Swift. <laughs> Arthur Swift is a really prominent plastic yes. surgeon, one of the first people to do injectables, yes. really a brilliant presenter brilliant. and thinker, uh -huh. yeah, I agree. So, uh, but I remember how nervous I was, but that's how important it is to me. After the fact, and this is how magnanimous he was, what a, this is the, the, the core of what we do. Afterwards, he came up like, I still dis I disagree with you. I think, but that was a good point you brought up. And I think uh, what I do because X, Y, and Z, not this. What's going on in, in, in injectables these days is you say something against the grain, and everyone's like, oh, and they get all they get all angry and they attack. Take it you. personally. They take it personally. So back to the original point. If I get up on stage, I want the nurses to question me. I want the PAs. I want the NPs. But to why not go get the MDs to question you? Um, I you know I say really I want them all to question me. I want. But everyone, you tell them to fuck off. Um, if they're, I want them to come back to me and say, no, fuck you. Here's why I, I say that. I want debate. I love debate. So I, you know, debate is the only way forward. We look, but you sit behind social media and you can throw fuck yous to people. Why not do those fuck yous in front of them? Like journal clubs, conferences, ad boards, you, you know, know, to that very point at the, you know, I do a meeting every year and this year in particular, we're going to have a day that's going to be nothing but debate. Where? And what's that? Where's where this debate? It's going to be in, Phil uh, in Philadelphia. Okay. So my annual needle needle art conference. Yeah. One day, I've never heard this at conferences. It's just going to be debate. Yes. I want to take five or six of the most controversial topics and have people who are known for thinking one thing in that on that one topic, and then the polar opposite on the other. And I want to get them up on stage, two podiums, and just like the classic, I love debate. It's just like when yeah. I'm in the car, people are listening to music. I listen to debates. Um, I love the mental jousting, and the, it's it's I, I love it. Um, so real quick, tell me yeah. a little about needle art, and it's your, it's your program that you do that's training. I mean, it looks fantastic. I haven't been to it yet. yet. I, I don't know if I make the cut to get invited course, one day. Of course. Um, but tell us a little bit about needle arts. If you would deign to come, um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's a, we, we just did two years. Uh, we did it once uh, two years ago, and then last year we did it again in Philly, and then this year will be the third year, maybe the final year. I like to change things up. I don't want anything to get stale. But it's like a, it's a this year it'll be a four day conference. Um, and it's a little bit of everything. I've designed a conference as I want a conference to be, the kind of conference I would want to go to. Um, you know, one day of, of, of content creation, one day of advertising and business, one day of technique, and then that fourth day of debate. That's going to be the... the um, Why do you do it, the conference? I just love the teaching. It's a, it's a creative, you know... Is it for money? No. I mean, I talked to my wife about this. Like, the amount of time that I spend in doing these lectures and stuff, like, if I just, like, I could just not do that and make a lot more money doing surgery. You know how lucrative surgery yeah, can course. be. So if I just, if I filled my schedule with surgery and made no time for that stuff, I would do better but financially. But, you know, the same, you know, when you, when you tell, and you see these people go up and speak in the industry and they make all this money. I know, I know who you're talking about. And um, I will tell you, when I first started coming through, and I'm talking 24 years ago, 23 years ago, I was doing research. There was no social media. 
there was time away from the office and from family to go to learn about these. I mean, aesthetics was just getting started. The Botox just got launched. There was fillers just got launched back then, wrestling. And we would do research and studies and we would we would debate it amongst ourselves. And derms and plastics, dermatologists and plastic surgeons couldn't even be in the same room. Uh -huh. All somewhere in the same room. And it took about three or four years for us to all be in the same room because there was so much fighting between the plastics and derms, the old school. I love that. Yeah. Well, it was it was pretty personal. But after a while, <laughs> we started coming together, we started thinking together. And uh I think if I look back at that time, I look back at it favorably because I was quiet and young and sat in the back of the room. I didn't want to say anything. But a lot of aesthetics got created at that moment, like all these ideas, these indications about what this field is. And it was because when I was training, it was plastic surgeons and master surgeons tell you what to do, and you just say, okay, we'll do uh -huh. what you would tell us. The dermatologists were really kind of with skin and maybe most surgery, and they were coming more towards aesthetics. So the two fields were merging at that time. People weren't doing it to make money. They were they they lose money. Like uh -huh. when we went to those conferences, we could make so much more money doing doing surgery or seeing patients in the office. So we did it because we had a true passion for it. Uh -huh. And I think when you look back in these KOs or key opinions, a lot of those people who started there, I, I like to include a lot of my friends, were like doing it because they really wanted to make the field better. Now I will tell you that I, I run a lot of meetings, as you know, mm -hmm. and I get people who are like, well, I want to be on stage, and they don't want to participate at all with like reading abstracts or helping or creating things, but they love to get their photos and they show up in the meeting for a little bit, they get their photo on the podium, they take it, they put it on social media. So I see that and I and I detest it because I feel like they're doing it just so they can have a social media post. It's kind of it's kind of gross. Like the, And that's, again, one of my main complaints with the conferences. And uh, you know, the conferences you run, I love, I gotta say. Uh, you don't I'm, have I'm to not, say that because not they're not that. mine conferences. I know, you know, I know, I'm just but I will the director. say yeah. Vegas Cosmetic is, is in particular, I know you yeah. want a bunch, but Vegas Cosmetic is that's I credit yeah. Vegas Cosmetic with giving me. Uh, it was a talk that I saw at Vegas, Vegas Cosmetic in the business management track that prompted me to take the risks I did on social media initially. I, I'm, I'm serious. Like it was, it was a talk about being yourself in your advertising. I'm sitting there in the audience, like miserable, and I'm like, well, what do I have to lose? I'm just going to do it. And I remember it was that talk not just that talk, the whole meeting is amazing. Yeah. So um, I, I often when people ask me what my favorite meetings are, Vegas Cosmetics. Is I loved cool. having you in Monaco. Yeah, it was cool. Monaco was cool. I thought that was great. I brought you there like many, yeah. five years ago or so. Yeah. And the, it was yeah. your first time on yeah, that kind of donation. Yeah. yeah, I thought you were so great. So I reached out to you and got you there. Well, thanks. Yeah. But um, but uh, to your point, the um, uh, it, it's become too much of a dog and pony show these days. Right. Get up on the step and repeat, take your pictures, or oh, the photo booth. Oh my God, the after, I love a good party as much as the next person. But it is becoming too much, and not, not your meetings, and again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm biased here, but so many of these meetings are just a dog and pony show. It's yeah. not about the science, it's about the, the pseudo, like the, the Instagram celebrities or whatnot. It's just like, why, why are we even here, you know? Yeah, and needle art is the opposite of that. I'm trying to make it that, and like you know, after last year, a bunch of people came up to me. They were, it was like a, they were just like, wow, that was like cool because I feel like it was all about like, you know, just thinking and questioning, and um, it was just a different vibe. You know, I'm trying to make it a cool vibe about thinking and um, and you know, critical think all the stuff that I want to see in a meeting. I've tried to make, and it's it's done. You know, it's it's. The first two years were pretty cool, so I'm looking forward to the next. But I don't want to make this plug about that. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. All right. So where is um, the future of Christian Subio? Um, I I'd like to you know I'd like to get back more into the teaching because at this after this past year of doing the conference, my wife and I said like we were both so happy at the end of the conference. And again, it's not about money or whatnot. I can make more money doing the surgery. At the end of the conference, like, wow, these people really enjoyed that. It seemed like it was special. Like, yeah, I'm feeling good. She's feeling good. We're part of something cool, like part of like this tribe of similar thinkers. Um, that's, so I want to lean, I've been kind of pulling away from doing um, education and conferences the past couple of years because I don't know, I didn't want to become just one of these career shills for the companies, et cetera. Um, but I want to kind of veer more back into the education because I like it. It's creative. Um, um, and I don't, don't want to be the surgeon who's, oh my God, I'm operating five days a week. I want to be teaching. I love the creative aspect of, of uh, making a, like an hour long lecture. That's almost like a little movie in itself. It has some artwork in it, has some humor in it to, to make it interesting. I love the creative uh, pursuit of creating teaching. So that's why I want to get back into the teaching. So, um, that's all I can say for certain at this at this time. 
Okay, I want to go a, a little bit on different directions because you love debate, you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, I know yesterday and rarely do you ever get political, mm -hmm. but I had some people reach out to me yesterday and say, wow, I, I, Christian said something that was really impressive and I, I was, they were happy, okay, the people who reached out to me. What are your thoughts on uh, using social media for political statements? It's tough because um, it's, you know, I am a plastic surgeon. Who necessarily wants to hear what I have to say? about a conflict in the Middle East that has been going on for a hundred years and beyond. Um, so on one hand, I don't want to proselytize who wants to hear necessarily what I have to speak. But then again, it's, I've been blessed with a, a lot of followers, you know, you know, a good, a good amount of social media followers who tune in every now and then to hear what I have to say. I've built a little platform for myself and these are patients of mine. they are students of mine. they are people who, who I, I, I you know, they're, I want to, if they're going through something, I want to be able to address it for them. And the, to the point about the, um, uh, the, um, the post I made yesterday, it was, um, you know, um, just for my Jewish followers, uh, you know, I value uh, all the teaching and mentorship. And, um, and like I said in the post, it's yeah. a very special group to me. So I want to let them know that, um, you know, I, I, I see you, I hear you. Um, and, um, you know, I, I understand what you're going through and it's, it's not right. Do you think the, the crowd that comes to you on Instagram versus other social media platforms is different? And you're, I, I don't do TikTok so much. I don't, know, I don't know if you're in that space, but do you, are, are you and do you see that different than uh, Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, LinkedIn? TikTok, you know, is a different beast altogether. Um, and uh, I missed the wave on that because I remember it happened during the pandemic and I tried it out a little bit. I was comfortable with Instagram. That was my my go-to and I'm like, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm just gonna put all my eggs in this basket. I should have put a couple eggs in the TikTok basket because I didn't when that wave was swelling up. Yeah. And I have friends, you know, uh, Ricky Brown and Tony Yoon, they have like seven, eight million followers because they caught the wave with their right. brilliant content at the right time and grew exponentially. But in the end, you can only do so many things at, the, at a given time. So I've, uh, I'm, I, I focus on Instagram because I just like it as a platform. It just makes sense to me. What's the next one, next platform you think? I don't know. Like, it, here's the problem. Everyone is now hyper attuned to looking out for the next platform. Remember Clubhouse came out a year or yes. two ago and everyone thought that might be the next wave. So everyone yeah. hopped on it for a hot three or four weeks and yeah. then it died down. Threads came along and everyone's like, oh, let me hop on threads. It's going to take over Twitter. And then no one's posting on threads anymore. So I think the problem is now everyone is aware that these waves, you don't want to miss the wave. So the next platform that comes along, if ever it does, you're, there's going to be stiffer competition. So you're not really looking for that next wave. You're not out there searching for it? Not searching for it. I mean, I'm very curious about uh, AI. Um, one of the talks we had at Needle Art last year, um, uh, Dr. Akash, he did a brilliant two talks on AI. That is certainly the future. I, I, you know, it's, um, I don't know how that's going to be the future, but that's going to be part of the future of plastic surgery, as is, I think, VR. Um, those two Virtual things, reality yeah, and uh, artificial those, intelligence, yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure how. But that's the whole beauty of the person that does figure out how is going to be the early converter and is going to reap all the rewards and everyone else is going to be playing catch up. All right. So um, we got to wrap up because I've been thinking up way too much of your time. No, please. It was a pleasure. <laughs> um, who, um, who inspires you both personally and professionally? Um, inspires me? Um, I... There's so many people I take inspiration from. Um, you know, my wife in particular, she temper. I'm inspired by her kindness, by her um, even headedness. Um, you know, she's the yin to my yang. I'm a little bit impulsive, reactive, and kind of like, you know, in your face. She's a more ca a calming presence in my life. So she inspires me to be a better person. Uh, my kids inspire me with their creativity. Okay, give me someone their, outside your family. Um, outside my family. Um, I love, honestly, um, like I mentioned, when I'm in the car, people, I like to look outside of the industry. So when I'm thinking, when you ask me who inspires me, like there's, I don't know, like all my day is ensconced in plastic surgery and injectables and stuff like that. So um, that's just work to me. Yeah. You know? Inspiration, I look elsewhere because... What about an artist like Salvador Dali or Picasso I love, I love or, Dali. or a scientist like Einstein or Tesla? Like, okay, These are all counterculture people like yeah. you. 
And here's the thing. When I say Dolly, it's like, you know, it's, it's almost cliche because every college student has a right. Dolly poster in the room. But for good reason. He was a brilliant man, outside the box thinker, a weirdo. He inspired me. He's so, so fucking weird, right? But he it was brilliant. I don't want to be that like everyone else. I want to be weird like Salvador Dali. When it comes to comedy, um, you know, people like George Carlin, uh, Lenny Bruce, these people have stepped outside yeah. who took chances and say, saying things against the grain, or Joan Rivers, who just didn't apologize to anyone. <laughs> she said what she thought. Um, so in in that realm, when it comes to um filming, I, I don't I, I look I look towards artists for my inspiration because I think they're 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 outside of the box. I'm doing everything I'm doing every day is just plastic surgery, plastic surgery, science, um, studies. Uh, I want to like be inspired by things that are going on outside of my lane. Are you a good family man? I, I think, yeah, I, I try. Um, you know, I get that from my parents for sure. You know, um, uh, they're, they're hardworking, they're good people. Um, they instill good values. They put a good head on my shoulder. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I try to be a good family man. When, um, when you're all said and done from plastic surgery, you've told me now that you're a misfit, you grew up a misfit. What do you want the industry to remember you as? Um, I, I guess um, as someone who, a free thinker, because one thing I cannot stand is the group think. Um, everyone just, oh, they say this, I'm going to agree with that. Like, and not to question the norms. I'm a free thinker. I aspire to be a free thinker who thinks on his own. I march to my own drummer. Um, uh, that's what I want to be remembered as. An individual, a free thinker, someone who's different. You know, someone who, who did just march to, like, to my own beat. Well, I think you are definitely someone who marches to your own beat. And that's why I'm here. Well, thanks, man. It's, I'm, again, I'm flattered that someone of, of your reputation would uh, be interested in anything I had to say. So I, I mean that uh, sincerely. Thank you. And I think I was a little bit like you back in the day. <laughs> yeah, <I don't laughs> a version that. of it. No. Except, except I had more hair back then. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I think um, I can keep talking to you for hours, which we're going to because we're going to dinner on yeah, our own. Yeah. But uh, I think it's enough for everyone else to listen to. Yeah. If they want to hear more, That's I'm it. happy to come out and awesome. interview you again. I really enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to talking more. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Awesome, man. Awesome. Appreciate it. I appreciate you.